no money miners, I'll tell you what, if you work for bloody Glencore or Trafford Euro and you want to know anything about any commodity, you two blokes are just ripping in to every metal known under the sun and Jesus Christ, Travis Ricciardo, are we in a pot- possible bloody commodity boom right now? I, the crunch. I feel like there's there's just a lot happening, Matty. It kind of feels a bit like an inflection point. Um, yeah, you know who knows who knows where this goes, but it, it, there's a there's a lot of really sharp movement in commodity prices that have been a little bit unloved for a while, and and there's a lot of low inventories. There's a lot of supply squeeze stories all floating about, and um, it's kind of exciting time to be doing a mining podcast, Matty. Oh, mate, you, no, it's you know why? Because we've made mining exciting. <laughs> We've made it exciting. What an exciting a year, a year ago, bloody mate. Northern Stars pre quarterly come out. We got given a demo on something yesterday about something that we think is, I say this, seri- seriously going to change the exploration industry. So we're going to do a bit of a segment on it. Um, what else got, boys? EQ Resources, Berkeley uh, heading to the arbitration court. J D. Dialing in from Melbourne, mate. The bloody – your features are looking in great contrast over there. Welcome to the show from abor- abroad, mate. That strawberry mate, blonde I'm, hair is very bright and vibrant today. <laughs> mate, I'm pumped. You've, you've missed the two biggest stories that we're going to chat about, I reckon. We're going to talk about tin and everything going on, and I'm sure that's going to get a few people on Twitter excited. Go and tin. we're also going to talk about everything happening in the world of PGMs. We've yeah, touched I'll on tie that, that into the whole every ago. metal. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, Jamie's Makes just sense. Pipe, <laughs> piping in from the, the head of metals and mining in Melbourne over there. <laughs> I'm pumped. I'm pumped. Right. Yeah. Sorry Sorry to bloody uh, didn't give that the credit it deserved, JD, but uh, that's there's a big chunk on PGMs and 10. Right, boys, take it away. Metal price possible bullishness, inflection points, as you say, Ricard Dinio. We like to get on to shit early Early on Money of Mine, take me through one by one what you see is going on around the world, Cobba. Mm, I, we, we, I reckon Jade and I probably fl- you know, flick through these each, but we, we've jotted down a bunch of different um, commodities where you're seeing some some really, really interesting price dynamics, especially, honestly, especially in the last week, maybe two weeks. Um, the charts we're going to flash up for the YouTube viewers, they're year-to-date charts, but so just keep that in mind. This is the year-to-date price movement. Um, the first one we'll just mention briefly is tin. Now tin's going to get its own special segment, uh, you know, in in, uh, in 10, 20 minutes time. So we'll just, but briefly, like tin is bloody going up. Twitter's going bonkers on tin. <laughs> There's a big supply story going on there. Um, and look at that, mate. Look at that price. Like that, that, that's just a straight line at the back end there. Year-to-date price is just like I wake up every day and tins up another bloody 5% mm. in the last few days. It's crazy. Yeah, but And JD, um, apparently zinc doesn't stink as much now. <laughs> Not as much. I'm pumped to hear what you've got to say later on on tin, Trav. Zinc, similar to what we spoke about with copper, the treatment and refining charges have just been dropping quite substantially. So tech and Korea Zinc signed a new deal. Similarly to how we spoke about it, these benchmark prices get set and they're dropping. And you've seen what's happened in copper, the the actual metal price as a result of, of um, these changes and that really sh- – that shortage of – concentrate supply being realized and yeah similar things are starting to happen in zinc which is interesting so you know you can see it in these yearly uh, year-to-date charts we'll flash out for zinc and for copper now as well copper's really started to move and a lot of the things we're talking about like you say trav they're they're starting to happen in the in the past couple of weeks but the the seeds have been sown you know a long long time ago for a lot of these movements it's been a a long time coming, and of note, a lot of the things we're talking about here are on the supply side. They're not this big, you know, driver of demand growth coming from decarb or whatever it may be. They are shortages of supply because the capex hasn't been spent over a long, long time frame. And you know, in a slightly different vein of thought, you can see it in gold as well. This is more on the back of geopolitical issues which have been you know pretty pretty rife and well publicized in the past couple of years as well as just huge amounts of government debt the the US government debt is the one that most people refer to and it's you know it's it's pretty enormous and i think people are people are sort of worried about that that's why they kind of are attracted to gold that's one of the reasons and you know even 
the only way to to, oh, no. to, to yeah, the, well, a lot of people think the only way to, to reduce that debt quantum is to debase your own currency via inf- inflation and hence, inflate your way out of it. Exactly, yeah, yeah, because yeah. your debt's always not denominated in nominal terms. But if you have inflation, it can reduce the real, like you know, quantum. Yeah, and but but then it's the the double whammy when inflation goes down, interest rates go down, and gold should technically go up uh, again, <laughs> based on history. It, so. Yeah, it, it works in mysterious ra- ways. And you can see with silver, which, you know, a lot of people hate referring to it as a precious metal. It's got a lot of industrial applications. But I, I've noticed in the last couple of weeks, people talking about silver for the first time since it, you know, got to brief bit of attention, I think in 2021 from memory. And manganese is the last one on the sort of more bullish side that I want to touch on. The, the price itself hasn't started to move. I think it's in a bit of an earlier stage given the supply difficulties we've spoken about. So a couple on the not so hot end of the spectrum that are worth touching on is iron ore. Again, pretty pretty well publicized the difficulties in China and these sorts of things. We saw it with all the fundies we spoke to at the end of December last year that the, um, the pick for commodity they were most bearish on was iron ore for a lot of them. And you know, nickel is is another commodity that we don't need to go into in great detail. It's it's in a bit of a different boat versus a lot of the other metals that we've spoken about with a huge rush of additional lower cost supply coming online. So I just wanted it's to like going round well out this that year, but nickel it's look, up, looking up at a little bit year to date, yeah, yeah. But it's it's still off a long yeah. way from the from the lows. Yeah. Do you think, boys? Yeah. Do you think ma- like manganese is that like a lot of that driving the South Thirty Two Gemco issue? Yeah. But are we do you think, I guess, copper being an example, is there going to be where the Cobre Panama shutting, there's a bit of a delay till it actually starts affecting the actual I commodity th- price? Is that could be different in manganese or I think similar? I think you're 100% on the money with a lot with this stuff, Matty. It's, I was having this chat with JD the other day about like a lot of the opportunities that that participants in in commodity markets, you know, mining stock markets have actually come as a result of the weird inefficiencies in the delay that it takes for for supply shocks to actually flow through to the market. J, JD tells a great story about when he started, um, you know, started looking at this sort of stuff, and you were you were in Brazil when there was you know the horrible kind of um, tailings dam failure for for Vale's operation out over there. Yeah, and the um the the ramifications of that through. That happened at the beginning of 2019 and the ramifications, like all these things, weren't totally clear at first. What became clear over time is that the Brazilian government came down on on Vale as well as BHB very hard. It, it wasn't the only dam disaster that had happened in recent years, but that took a huge amount of supply offline. And there were another a bunch of tailwinds coming out the back of that. But if you look at the iron ore miners from that beginning of 2019, you know, over over the next 24 months or so, the returns were just massive. I think Fortescue went from four bucks to something like 20 bucks. They were paying special divvies on top of dividends, and the same went for BHB. The same went for Rio. And the thinking at the time was, you know, after a week or so, oh, this is going to be priced in, but that just clearly wasn't the case, and it took a long time. And the, the a similar sort of thing. And I'm not saying the same thing's going to happen in manganese. We don't know, but we're in that stage where you wonder what the damage is at, at Groot Island and you just don't know. Is it going to be offline for three months, six months, 12 months? It's a very hard question to answer. And it plays into the issue of inventories and stockpiles and all these sorts of things. The actual movements of the prices take take a while to play out, especially in these smaller, you know, more opaque markets. Iron ore is obviously a, a massive market. And manganese just isn't of the same scale. Well, I think Matt Fernley said what lithium, the about the length of the supply chain for to head to a battery was what six to nine months before it mm. what's been mined actually starts taking effect. Yeah, it's funny yeah. how it's funny that time it takes, right? And in manganese it's it's um it's interesting, like while the commodity price itself has yet to to really kind of I mean, I think it's just starting to itch up now. Because I think what you have is inventories decline first and then of course price is always set at the margin. Um, it's not until you know your stocks are lower that you really see a big a, a big response for whatever reason. Um, in the case of manganese, though, despite the fact that the commodity price hasn't hasn't like really rapidly changed, the equities 
have. You look at um, look at Jupiter's up fifty percent in the last you know month or so, which we should probably disclose. We, we own a couple, so ding 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 on that front. But it's 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 interesting to see that stock up fifty percent without the commodity price movement. So in some ways, you know, you do have a degree of pricing these things in JD without. Um, but but I do think there is this this fallacy that we often think when you come out of uni and you learn that markets are efficient and all of these things get, get priced in the moment news is out. But, um, but yeah, I think there are certain kind of supply shocks that can, can the, the reality of them can uncover over time rather than be immediately apparent overnight. Yeah. Agreed, mate. And the, the, the point I want to round out on there is inflation. You mentioned it earlier, Maddie. US inflation data came out overnight from, from the States and it came in hotter than anticipated. And I've no doubt that raw materials, commodity prices played their played a role, you know, in, in building things in the real world on what that inflation figure was. And I'm probably in the in the camp of the people thinking that that is something that's going to be substantial in the in the coming years. Mm, I think they're indicating possibly not rate rate cuts till end of the year over there. So um Anyway, we don't it's changing go, all the time. Hey, stick in your lane, Manny. Don't go too macro, cover. <laughs> uh, boys, should we uh, delve into the PGMs in a bit more detail? Who's uh, who's bloody putting their hand up for this one? This is um, mate. JD is, is Mr. Contrarian. Oh. He, he just gets excited when things are in the doldrums, and this is what he's excited about now. <laughs> oh, I'm pumped rule. about this one. <laughs> <laughs> mate, what's Not going sure about on? That, Maddie, but Take it away, brother. And I, I. Do not own any any position in any PGM player, but I'm getting very excited reading reading the stuff that I'm reading and what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to focus on what's happening on the supply side of PGMs with a, a little bit of the demand narrative sort of weaved in. So I'm going to start with three of the biggest players. You've got Amplats, which is owned by parent company Anglo American. They were talking about selling some of their higher cost operations. Obviously, when the the commodities are, you know, in a in a bit of a trough. It's not the time you really want to sell an operation. But we'd spoken about a month ago about how dire things were getting, and their CEO had said nothing was off the table in terms of a review of all the assets. So they didn't get any buyers. They were looking to sell um, Amanda Belt. It's a, a big complex, as well as the Twickenham Platinum Mine, which is on care and maintenance. And they, they didn't get any bidders. Now, they're in a a broader spot of bother at the moment. They're 40% owners in Gemco, the manganese asset, which we just touched on, which obviously isn't performing well at all. They've got diamond operations, which have seen write downs to the tune of 1.6 billion US dollars recently. They've got a lot of pressure coming from these lab created gems, especially in, in the States. And you can add to that a $800 million write down for their Barro Alto nickel project in Brazil. And then you know, what we're going to talk about here today, their PGM business not doing well either. So they're in a really tough spot. They spoke about letting go of 3,700 people in the PGM part of the business alone. So that's mm. that's pretty unfortunate to hear. And a lot of those job cuts would come from the Amanda Belt complex. So remains to be seen whether we can or whether they can have any material changes to the cost base of those assets. But, you know, it's, it would be pretty hard. And then you've got Zimplat. So in a similar part of the world there, the uh, the dominant miner in Zimbabwe, they've come out and made the statement that they're only going to cut 1% of their work staff. And you know you can bet that is a, a result of the balancing act within the community that they operate. So they need to appease all the stakeholders in, in the mine there. So they want to maintain production at 600,000 ounce PGM ounces, but everything's been cut back. CapEx been cut back. They're only spending what they need to, you know, quote unquote, stay in business. And, you know, things like the the second phase of a solar plant that gets cut along with a whole bunch of other growth projects. And then you've got Sabanye. Now they're talking about doing a US $500 million metals prepayment deal. This is essentially a, a streaming deal, which you commonly see with companies trying to come online. So they're trying to get cash in the door for the, the right to for a um, the provider of that capital to buy the commodity in future at a at a very much markdown price, and it's pretty glaringly obvious if you are a mining company already, not a developer, you're only going to do that if you're in a spot of bother and need the capital. So they also had a US 2.6 billion dollar impairment across their palladium, nickel, and a gold mine in 
South Africa. So Isn't just that so to round out, JD, like Sibanya, who, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that they, like, you know, spent up cash off of her freaking new century. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's crazy doing all those deals to like, like jointly fund all of these like lithium operations. You know, aren't they like JV partners on some big lithium bets? And I mean, well, yeah, it's just yeah, it is crazy. Yeah, in the um, Iron Air, right? Yep. I think they, yeah. they, 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 they were spraying money into a few other things too, but yeah. 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 So just to round off on Sibania, so Morgan Stanley forecast negative free cash flow of US $500 million for the year for Sibania. And, you know, that, that puts them in a bit more of a precarious situation than the, and the other two. So with that all in mind, let, let's talk about the actual PGM market because you, you hear all those things. And I just think they're, they're the hallmarks of a commodity, you know, really hitting low levels. We're talking about layoffs, mine closures, investors thinking demand won't even exist in a few years' time, growth capex just being cut, hardly any new supply coming online, prices at multi-year lows, cost inflation just ripping through all the existing mines. You've got unions working on contracts. They're being negotiated. They're going to see jumps in prices, which is jumped in costs for the miners. Sanctions, the mines getting deeper grades falling, power grid challenges in South Africa, which is a dominant, dominant player in the PGM market. And then you, you sort of round that off with the fact that half of these operating mines aren't even profitable. I mean, like that that doesn't sound too rosy, does it, guys? No, no. Well, that's all. The first sign is curtailment, isn't it? When yeah. uh, something, mm. something changes structurally in a commodity. Yeah. When you think yeah. of like, like commodity markets, they're cyclical for a reason it's because of the you know you you have the supply contraction response and then all of a sudden prices rebound once you get supply contraction in a substantial way and then obviously (coughs) um when prices rebound it just takes a long time for you to get a supply response to the upside if if there's a if that you know depending on the way that the commodity works you know ramping back up is not easy you've worked on mines matt it takes time to ramp up (laughs) Yes, yeah, I've so been, I've been rained on too. Rain, <laughs> rain does exist on mine sorts. I have been there. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, when you think about that market, guys, it's it's essentially a few mines in South Africa, Zimbabwe, a big Russian mine, and then recycling. Recycling makes up a big part in in PGMs. But just looking through the companies we've we've just spoken about, like that is a market pretty pretty primed for disruption and. You know, think about the the Russian mine. It's Norilsk, huge, huge mine. We've touched on quite a few times in the past. That's been hampered by sanctions. Things are getting deep, and that's still probably the um, the the standout asset in the space. But they've you know had their costs ramp up phenomenally from stuff not being able to enter the country. You know, they can't get their DSI orders and whatnot into <laughs> into Russia because of all the um, the sanctions issues. So. <laughs> JD, what a zinger. <laughs> what a zinger. I'm like, you Just are came. on fire over there. <laughs> so, you know, that that leads me into the next point about recycling when you're trying to get a broader sense of what's what's happening in, in the market. And recycling plays a huge role in the PGM market. And you can just look at any analyst, any investment banking sell-side report on, on the space, and they've got quite varying uh, forecasts for what recycling makes up. But Across the board, they tend to be pretty bullish because of the fact that you know you can you can take the PGMs from internal combustion engine cars when they when they go in the the yard and they can be reused. But you need to think of it as as another mine essentially in terms of it's got a break even price and an incentive price. You need no one's going to start a business recycling these things unless they make money to do so. And with the prices at where they where they currently are. There's no incentive for people to go to all the effort, hire the people. It's pretty capital intensive, you know, and do the do the work of taking off these components and adding them as sort of new supply into the market. So you need to see price changes. That's a, another sort of check in the box. And then we get into inventories, which we just kind of spoke about with a whole bunch of metals, and it's pretty opaque. And it makes me think of lithium. We spoke about, like you said, Maddie, with Matt Fernley, and you know he's a guy that followed the the lithium space still follows the lithium space in great detail and he couldn't even get color on what these you know what what the destocking restocking supply deficit levels are currently at for the commodity so you know it's no different in pgms it's it's hard to get a good gauge on where inventories are currently at 
and they they add buffers in and around supply and demand shocks to to mod- commodities, just like in manganese, like we just said. But one thing you can say for certain is that when the Russia-Ukraine conflict started, OEMs, the, the car makers, built up big inventories because they got very scared that they wouldn't be able to get their hands on supply. And you can just look at the price chart, which, which, which will flash up as we're speaking here, and all of the commodities, you know, rhodium, palladium, platinum and stuff, they all skyrocketed over that period. And it it really just makes me think, just like high prices are the cure for high prices, the same goes on the flip side. All these things, are, you know, they're the opposite. And low prices are the cure for low prices because they're a disincentive to bring on supply. Yeah. And now, Maddie, tying in one of the one of your favorite sort of topics, we're going to talk about short positions just briefly. And this is in the oh. speculative in the um, commodities excel themselves, not the actual mining companies, but they're at, you know, near record pro- highs on certain markets. So that just screams to me as a, a space that is still pretty bloody hated. And underlying all of this, mate, is, is um, like you, there's got to be an outlook on demand as well, which obviously ties into hybrids, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I'd encourage anyone who hasn't listened to the chat we had with Cav and Rusty a couple of weeks back to go and listen to that first because I'm sure they'll uh, – or I'm sure Rusty who spoke to it there will be able to explain it in way better detail than, than I can. But there's a detail that's not – widely spoken about or understood and that's that hybrid vehicles use more pgms than internal combustion engine vehicles and that's because they need a shift between the combustion engine and the battery power essentially so i think you can make the argument that hybrids don't actually eat too too massively into ev demand you know perhaps not as dramatically as some people think and they in fact add new demand for those people who are sitting on the fence mm not you know thinking about whether they are going to convert to a full EV and the hybrid being the the middle ground so I'd, li- I'd like I- to see the percentage of um, people out there that the biggest ticket item for them is fear of running out of battery now, I think it'd be yeah. pretty high and this is going to be the the transition for that group of people I'm one of them yeah, I think in Australia, I've seen like polls and whatnot, and that range anxiety is a you know one of the you know top concerns that people have about purchasing an EV. And yeah, the, there you go. The the hybrid example speaks to that, and I think it it doesn't you know destroy the the narrative here. It it encourages the the sort of PGM bull case, and that's not even to mention a detail that we did speak about where I believe PGM intensity in internal combustion engine vehicles will go up over time because if you remember what the role of it is in the autocatalytic converter it's to limit pollution so i think governments will dictate over time increases in essentially in the demand of pgms because of the 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 reduced pollution at the at the exhaust pipe so all up that's that's kind of my thoughts on pgms for a while and i'm very keen to hear if there's an expert out there who knows much more about it than I do, to, to come on the show and talk about it. I, re- I reckon P- PGMs would have to be one of the things that is the most up in the air at the moment because it's hinging a lot on are plug-in hybrids going to be the next thing or are, or are EV adoption rates for the full EVs going to be quicker? Like it's just who who knows? <laughs> like It's very yeah. up in the air. Everyone's yeah, agreed, got a mate. different think... opinion. You even had Rusty and Cavon that had very different opinions in in one episode. Hmm. So the the one thing I'd caveat that with Maddie is that I think a lot of people just don't care. It's like one of those one of those you know commodity baskets or one of those s- small niche parts of a, a sector which is already quite niche that just doesn't have many eyeballs on it. Until but, now, mate, that's the perfect segue <laughs> into the commodity I want to talk about. <laughs> Perhaps, perhaps with even less eyeballs. I think tin maybe has more eyeballs in it. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely niche. It's like the um, the unloved industrial mineral tin. <laughs> <laughs> it's got it's got a real tin. Fa- it's got a, a real fan following in the UK. A lot of a lot of um, yeah, like the UK mining crowd love yeah, tin. Yeah, well, that was from because Cornwall and that was that was totally that was a tin mining town. Hunt, you're, I think you're yeah. bang on the money. There. Is the, there's nostalgia there. Yeah, the history. And of if those anyone, places. 
if anyone wants a good kit, go and follow Tin Investor on Twitter because whoever <laughs> runs that account is freaking hilarious. I've got no idea who it is, but I love it. You cannot be more transparent on what that profile is about. Yeah. <laughs> tin Investor. <laughs> Best memes in mining come from, from uh, Tin Investor. He's a, oh, a mate, very funny dude. Travin, you've been, you've been yeah. following Tin for a bloody long time, mate. Yeah, and unlike JD on um, the PGMs, I, I do need to do a ding, ding, ding on – I do own a Tin stock. So um, that's – but I'm, I want to talk about it because there's there's action here, there's movement here. I've owned my mm. Tin stock for ages, so, so I'm really excited for it. Before you yeah. get into it, Trav, when, yeah. when did Tin first – Start ringing alarm bells to you about oh geez this is a very interesting I bought, commodity. I bought tin thinking that there was going to be a, a supply uh, like crush. Like there was there was a bit of murmurs. I think it was late, um, basically late July last year that you know the WA state, which is you know in Myanmar, they've got um, they're having a crackdown on supply coming out of Myanmar. Um, and the junta, yeah, that was to that was to take effect first of August. So I sort of bought in the lead up to that, and Tin did absolutely fucking nothing until and and then you know January this year, um, there was some reporting into what was happening in Indonesia, and I got interested again. And then it's it's kind of like there'd been no exports out of out of Indonesia for effectively two months, which I'll, I'll get to in, in my bit. Um, and then yeah, Tin price has really seen a response in the in the last couple of weeks. So. I'll tell that story for you though, Matty, because you asked, but that's that's why I got interested in it. Very good, yeah. mate. Thank you. Yes, but mate, there are some barons, some tin barons out there who've <laughs> been like bloody, yeah, long and strong tin for a long time, lo- much longer than I have. So, you know, you've got to give it to the, the barons who have just been so bullish this industrial critical mineral um, for, for the longest of time. Time to talk about it because it hit $33,000 <laughs> per tonne overnight. And in the space of a week, it rose 11%. The, the pressures on the tin market right now, you know, they're undoubtedly supply related. Um, I'd, I'd categorize them as. And I want to do my best to articulate the the some of the best commentary I've read on on the tin market today. To start with, you know, like we, the 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 thesis I, I, I kind of want to hash out is is one shared by um, this you know guy Mark Thompson. Uh, invitation remains open to him to come to the potty, but effectively since the 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 mid nineteen eighties, Indonesia they've been like the world's largest supplier of mined tin. Uh, look at this chart here, which basically shows you know tin supply by country over time, um, and it's you know pretty clear there that you know Indonesia have, have have been a real dominant player. You see that light shade of pink on that chart that just sort of popped up in the in the about 2006. 2010. 2010. That's yeah. Myanmar um, that sort of popped up there. Oh but, yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. So that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you look at that chart, um, like in 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 2023, the 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 country being Indonesia, they produced 78,000 tons of tin. Now, sweet fuck all has been exported out of Indonesia in the first few months of 2024. The the export quotas look set to be limited to only 44,000 tons per annum. Um, why? What's underlying all this? There's There's been basically massive fraud and corruption investigation underway in Indonesia involving the state miner there called PT Tima. It's officials, you know, governments involved. Um, they're, they're effectively, there were effectively huge number of illegal artisanal mining happening and it was rapidly depleting the country's reserves there. The artisanal miners were basically, you know, um, selling their, their, their supply into the smelter and, and, and getting uh, handsome fees along the way. But, but you're kind of having these, you know, w- way higher um, amounts of, 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 of production than were acceptable for, for sort of sustainable production, depleting the reserves pretty rapidly there. And so the state has ultimately cracked down on it massively. And to crack down on it, they've halted exports while they clean things up. If you want to see what's going on with that story, look up Jeff Sorek. His commentary has been like really early to this story and, and, and there's really very little commentary about it at all. If you look beyond Indonesia though, because that's only part of the story, Myanmar, that's where production ramped up from in the early 2010s. Like they, they've... You know, every indication is that there's been apparently a cessation of mining in WA state since the 1st of August last year. Um, then if you go to the DRC, this is when we talked about this in the past. Of course the DRC has <laughs> tin. It's got everything, that joint. It does, mate. There's um, oh, yeah. a listed producer there, uh, Alphaman. Um, you know, the total country produces 20,000 tonnes per annum of tin, you know, 12,000 from Bicey and 8,000 of artisanal production. Uh, Bicey is set to grow imminently to 20,000 tonnes per annum from um, the opening of uh, Mpama South, though. But 
there's, there's been an insurgency by the M23 rebels to the uh, west of Goma, displacing one million people. And, and there are reports that the rebels now control the main supply route to Baisi with, you know, the implications of that still being unclear as they unfold into the, the tin market. I'll just read a bit of commentary from the International Tin Association last month. They say, traders in Europe have commented that tin is increasingly difficult to source with shipments additionally delayed by continuing disruption in the Red Sea. Further extended licensing delays indicate that exports from Indonesia may remain suppressed for some time. Um, in China, a feedstock squeeze due to cessation of tin mining in Myanmar's WA state since 1st of August adds increased uncertainty when combined with the loss of Indonesian supply, which accounted for 73% of China's refined tin imports in 2023. Right, so that's, the, that's where it's coming from. Who wants it? Trap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, tin, like, tin's used in soldering, obviously, and it's in tens of thousands of consumer electronics globally uh, in, in, in very minute amounts. And because it's in minute amounts, it's relatively price inelastic, hence not much substitution effect at elevated prices. So it's, that, and that's the biggest use of it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. in like all your consumer electronics, but it's like a fraction of a cent worth in each sort of iPhone. Yeah. You know, so they don't care if they up. can find something cheaper. Nah, it's that, I mean, yeah. like, yeah. What are you? I think solder is, yeah, 50% of all tin output is, is soldering. So the, the glue on electronics. If you, if you look um, kind of at, at what's accounting for some of the, you know, the growth in demand for, for parts of the tin market, a, a huge driver of new demand in, in recent years is, of course, related to solar. Um, as, as it stands, 70 tonnes of tin is required per gigawatt of installed capacity. Now, that accounted for 28,000 tonnes of tin in 2023, or about 7% of total demand, but that, that portion of the market is growing like pretty pretty substantially over time. Um, and then like when you, when you wrap all of that together, that's kind of the, the bull case for the tin market right now. And if, if, if I, I'll just sort of tie it all back into uh, the sentence from, from Mark and he says, supplies under threat like never before, supply chains are destocked. There are almost no new projects. Demand is highly inelastic. That's kind of the, the tin baron uh, bull thesis. And so I think like it's, it's one of those, you know, rare times you have a commodity where you have a pretty defined market. You have some um, like three coalescing supply crunch or potential supply crunch kind of um, in, in areas of major production at, at the same time. And, um, and yeah, the, 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 the price is sort of, you know, been responding over the last couple of days, but there are of course, uh, yeah, like, you know, risks associated with this stuff as, as, as supply can like the queue for high prices, like we always talk about is also high prices. Mm. Yeah. Well, mate, Trav, I want to, you're right. Joe, I want to give, I want to give one quick shout out. You mentioned Mark Thompson there earlier. As someone else I'd love to get on, Literally around the corner, about 50 meters from the office, is uh, Denim Capital. And they are, uh, last time I saw, 57% shareholders of Alphamin. That's a you know billion plus dollar company. And I'd love them to come on and talk about their thesis on tin. And also of note, the offtake contractor at Alphamin is one Gerald Group. Ah. <laughs> so. Friends mate, of the show. Mate, if you're going to have high conviction, you need bloody good research just like that, Trav. Speaking of high conviction, did you take that Twitter bet? I did. Yeah, I did. Is Wait, it on? Uh, for South 32? Yeah. No, no, not that bet, no. But I – no, that one, he never he never replied, that bloke. Oh, yeah. geez, that was great Friday yeah. night viewing on the shit, I put it that way, yeah. mate. I did, have, I did have to accept another Twitter bet, though, and that was um, <laughs> the – the spec capital who said, if I get a hundred referrals, what will you do? So oh, okay. I, I should probably have to do a ding, ding, ding. I own a, a very small amount of a PGM stock as a result of that, which I <laughs> won't say its name. That was a, lef, a less <laughs> confrontational um, yeah. bet, that one. Well, well, boys, I haven't got a commodity to speak of, but sounds like you two boys with the high conviction you have got on this, these two commodities or sets of commodities, I would suggest people go and find them and be exposed to it, and Seamus Murphy in any time exploration is the bloody crew to facilitate it. It's interesting you say that. The, g the geos, the drillers, the people, the bloody everything the, to make the exploration happen. Yeah, part Traff. of the part of the, uh, the Tin Baron bull thesis is a complete like lack of new projects, and why why has there been no exploration in uh, for, t for Tin projects? I mean, the commodity's been in the doldrums for, for ages, mm. and and – as soon as you see a supply response, guess guess what, mate? People 
people start doing exploration again. They come running, they come calling for Seamus Murphy and the Anytime team, mate. They sort that all out. They Would you say they're commodity agnostic? They don't care what they're bloody exploring for. They just explore. <laughs> Is that the right word to use, agnostic? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know mate, what words well mean, but I know when to use them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know why I like Seamus as well, guys? Why do you like him, J.D.? And he just supports the industry. WA, he supported Exploration Radio. He supported us from the get-go. He's looking after WA people. Yeah. Now, you should look after him, support another WA business and get him involved in your exploration camp, in your development project. Just give Seamus a call. Well, you look after him a little bit. He looks after you a shitload by providing you anything you need for exploration. He can bloody, he can set the site up with his earth moving bloody gig. He can provide the people, the mineral resources, the geo consultant services, the soil sample and the core cutting. Far out he does everything. I love the bloke. Yeah, Good on you, Seamus. Yeah, must be working that much, mate. He just had, he just hired a, um, a BD manager on LinkedIn, Andy Seal. So congrats on the job, mate. Oh, and, um, Andy. And, you- I, and I hope all of this influx of business, you, you know, you can just take a take some, take some some of the, the work he, off he'll of have shame, to, shame shoulders. He'll have to, but our ads, like old Andy be doing pretty much sweet fuck all because <laughs> <laughs> everything's flying no, in the door already. We advertise, yeah, but we don't have to do yeah. any work after Jeez. that. Sorry, mate. Hopefully you keep your job. <laughs> hey, all right, boys, uh, Northern Star. Pre-quarterly operational update. It's interesting they – oh, it's because they dropped the guidance. That's why. No, I don't see the big dogs do these pre-quarterlies as much. But um, No, they sort of pre-warn the market that yeah. the costs have jumped. Yeah, it wasn't too, it wasn't too bad. Sold, buddy, sold 401,000 ounces, previous quarter 412. All in sustain, and the all-in sustaining cost previous quarter was, all, was 1824. Again, affected by serious weather events across the uh, northern gold fields, which I have confirmed talking to Mr. Ricciardo. I think your bloody old girl lost the power in uh, Kalgoorlie for a bit. Kal- Kalgoorlie was... did have a, a blackout for a few days there. Uh, yeah, it was like mm. three or so days. Yeah, yeah so it yeah. sounded a pretty bloody horrific uh, Early Jan- or mid-Jan. R- rain yeah. and electrical dramas there. So, yes, anyway, they were uh, they were re- reassured strong part start to the quarter. Bloody 11 days in, so it must be bloody, must be a strong start. Um, lifts in grades across the operations and mills are going to be spinning more apparently. It was flagged in the previous quarters that the gold side was going to be weighted towards the second half of this financial year. So I would imagine they'd be feeding all the good shit in pretty rapidly this quarter considering the impacts for the start of this year. So they, they've reaffirmed guidance, 1.675 million ounce midpoint they've they've sold around 1.18 so far so leaving them with about 417,000 ounces to reach the bottom end of guidance so needs to be lifted up a bit but sounds like the grades are going to be lifting and and everything hopefully but they've lifted their um their all in sustaining costs has gone up a bit from 1750 to 1835 so net cash down 174 mil they've got down from 238. Um, they did pay the interim dividend, 169 mil. But look, capex guidance, as we've said many times before, 1.2 billion for this financial year, another 150 bucks on expiration. They're in a big growth phase to set up and expand this KCGM. And look, they just can't really expect any significant free cash flow. Uh, until around FY26, looking at how the timeline's going. So that is where Northern Star was last quarter, and they're in the same spot now. <laughs> uh, it's, it's such an interesting one. They produce just such an amazing quantity of um, quantity of gold. Oh, like 400,000 ounces for a quarter. Like that's It's, it's fucking yeah. huge, isn't it? And then it? when gold rips, yeah, it just kind of sucks when you see that cost creep higher, doesn't it? Yeah, and mm. and unhedged as well. So yeah, yeah they got like if they do have a bumper quarter this one with the gold price doing what it's doing, mm. they're um they're pretty bloody leveraged to it. But still a lot of capex going out the door, which is uh, just what they're doing and what they have to do. Right, boys, we got a. I'll tell you what, we had an interesting chat yesterday, and now this is this is not a bloody piss take advertisement here. This is genuinely me being serious for a change but Steve the top dog at Verify gave us a demo yesterday of the new artificial intelligence system 
that they got going for Verify. And after seeing it, we were left impressed and like, holy shit, this is going to shake up the exploration industry. Um, and we're going to going to give a quick demo, but I want to want to actually talk about what this could actually mean as a step change for exploration. Boys, you are a bit um, you are a bit impressed, weren't you? I, th- I think there's a lot of reason to be excited if if you're um, yeah if you if you're looking for for minerals at the moment, it does you do really get the sense that for for the first time ever, obviously, um, there's going to be a capability to to like remove a lot of human bias that comes with, uh, with, with, with expiration. You know, we have all of these human biases associated with us. We, 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 we hate, we, we, we get, we get, people get attached to projects like we talked about with Ahmed or we, we overweight one, um, you know, one, one piece of data being at like whatever the, re, the, the latest layer of data was that we got. And we, we forget to, co- you know, combine that with all the other things to mm. think, oh, it's these two things that matter, these two layers of data that matter. And it looks like there are, pretty serious advancements when it comes to the, the, the tech platforms, which might actually, you know, lead to a much greater rate of, um, of discovery, which would be really, really, really bullish exploration, an area where we haven't had great returns on investment to date. Mm, more, and more efficiencies in exploration as well. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd echo that. It's, um, you know, the, the mining industry is quite notorious for being a bit of a, a lag out and not adopting technology super quickly just because you know in often many cases the the upfront capital is so great and you don't want to be the one that sort of falls on your face so I'm, I'm pretty excited about what this could mean and i'm sure there's people out there with with far more experience than us that could bounce their ideas on what they're thinking about these potential ramifications on the industry back toward us because I'm, I'm quite excited to hear what what people in the industry have to say about it, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do get on the bloody tools here, Trav. Give us your bloody computer, because uh, oh, oh, that's I'm just gonna, <laughs> I, I need the grunt, I need the grunt, right? Here we yeah. go, money miners. We're just doing a bit of a shifty witsy. Oh, Jesus Christ! I've never been on this side. It's bloody hiding me gut. It's uh, bloody brilliant. <laughs> Right, here we here we go. Maddie on the tools, the demo. I'll tell you how this is this bloody works. So here we go. It's they're pretty much taking data from one area of drill holes, using it to predict another area, and bloody mixing and matching, and then running that AI all across a bloody tenement, and just running that thousands of times, and it pretty much gives every little bit of the area a percent score on the chance that there's mineralization and then it gives you these predicted models here of where they likely see think there's going to be mineralization now this was a test example on an existing ore body and those red bits there are actually the the actual ore body and it just shows using the testing and and the ai it acts like the ore body's lined up pretty much bloody bang on with what the predictive model gave so what we're really talking about for the for the people tuning into the potty is being able to spend your exploration dollars better, being able to try and use all the data you have together, which is of course what geos have been working on, you know, ma- manually for you know for history, but just trying to get more bang for your buck in forecasting where to point the rig essentially going forward. Yeah, and like it, how it works, when we talk data, we're talking here's one where they use an existing operation. It's like it's assay data. Here's like this is all your, your layers of different geophys that's been done and that is all the data that feeds this bloody AI model. That's an important point, right? I mean, like look at all of the different layers of data that you get your hands on in exploration. I don't know how to interpret any of that stuff. I don't know how highly to weight certain things. Of course, there are these like relationships that exist, but I do feel like a lot of the times when people are doing exploration, especially for stuff that gets deeper and deeper, you don't know, you don't actually quite know some of the relationships. Mm. Some of the relationships between, you know, buddy, nickel percentage here leads to this, whatever over yeah. there. All that stuff is like, it kind of just is so variable depending on deposit, but it's pretty intriguing that um, you can al- almost outsource the grunt work required to figure out those relationships to uh, a, a, a computer that can tell you, um, you know, what what proportions of things to weight things, put all those, that data together, and then it can say probabilistically 
you know, we think there's, we think it's worth bloody drilling here. Um, yeah, well, like here's the example, like that geofiz then combined with all the assay data, that gives them, that gives them this. They're all the predictive models. And then from that, just from the geochem, see how like when they when it starts learning from new data, like what you call machine learning, provides all these new little areas, and it shows right there's a fold there, there's a fault here, and those areas that aren't lit up because they're not the known areas, they're like right, they're all your bloody your drill targets to to go and start punching, all taken from all that data. So Southern Southern Cross Gold, they're a bit of a power user. They're the bloody uh, – and, Trav, you ref- referenced them in um, one of the previous episodes, how they showed the verified model to justify the exploration target. Mm. Here's, here's what bloody ver- the Verify AI did there. So they actually trained the AI based on, like, existing 15 gram per tonne hits to try and use that – where those hits are and – to find more potential high-grade targets. So they absolutely had a shit ton of geophys and geochem data, you can see here, oh, wow. and along with all the assay data. And then that come gave them six target areas. Two of them were known because when they were using the existing drilling, that supported it, um, and the predictive model lines up with that. They Then it shows off to the side, like I guess the next target area they're going to – they should start punching holes into, which is – to the right down there. So you can see this here. And then the greatest thing about like that is that that's like accurate to a meter. So it's not like a, an, a range and everything. So when you're playing in the drill holes, you know, pretty bloody bang on where you're going to start putting them. And then from all that, cause you know, your geophys data covers such a bloody big area. It covers, it then starts predicting from that ones that are like, way out of the road like so they never come up bright bloody pink at the start red at the start because they're it hasn't got the data but that's like right there's your next drill target and it says right based on the uh shape of that main structure and existing faults it like pretty much maps out a pretty bloody defined area to go and have a look and with the bloody drill and when i think you mentioned it before trav that when it tells you it it gives you the model of where to go to, but then it actually gives an explanation of why it's taken you there. So it, if you have a look at this one here, it's pretty much so that dotted line there is like the threshold for mineralization. So on the right-hand side of it, that's what's going to be mineralized. The blue colors mean a low value of something and a red means a high value. So for this example here, it's saying that these this has been supported by saying that low nickel values and a high manganese uh, magnesium value are the two biggest indicators that support mineralization for the AI. And so like the, the G, the rock liquor team then says to them like, okay, why, why is that? How does that make sense? And, but then they like, thinking of the actual geology behind it for this for this case it's like well when these gold <coughs> bearing dikes are formed the nickel's removed from the rock and then the magne- magnesium is actually injected into the system so buddy and then it's like oh yeah there you go and then you go back through all the other data to possibly find cases where that is magic trying to do that bloody manually and then bloody verify uh i think they i think clients enjoy actually getting the data cleaned up <laughs> and bloody shit everywhere and then that just feeds into the mineral resource so look how can uh, i just look at this and think far out you look at all the geos that work on site um how much easier life would be it doesn't make them bloody redundant but imagine streamlining and all that manual shit out of your day and you can actually focus on really bloody finding shit it i was friggin' impressed and i'm like wow this is if you applied this to most exploration companies, just even being able to more accurately hit things and not skim all bodies because it's down to the meter, success rate, yeah. it's not a guarantee. No, definitely not. But like we talked about it with, with Ahmed. Like he reckons the exploration funding model is broken because like, you know, you're fighting so much inertia, incentives aren't always aligned. And the, if, importantly, the returns have been absolutely cooked if you've invested in exploration in aggregate. Because because of all these issues, well, the biggest lever you can pull is literally increasing the probability of success. And I think we're at that like po- point in time 
where the tools are, are firming up and getting actually real that really do improve the probability of success. The proof is going to be in the pudding when when this stuff leads to, to new discoveries. But mm. the, the predictive capability you're seeing, the ability to reconcile it with um, – with historic is is impressive and I'm, I'm kind of excited for that next phase of when you know you might have a, a renaissance or a boom in exploration again maddie mm, yeah that, oh, that's mate. the point i'd that's the point i'd round out on trav that's what i think super interesting that it's it's not a replacement you know it's going to be awesome to see wicked you know geo teams working with the data to improve their capability Anyway, these bloody uh, verify buggers, they're taking over the world in exploration. I bloody love it. Impressive. Give old Grant at Verify an email. Or oh, bloody even Steve at Verify. <laughs> Steve at Verify.com. <laughs> hey, bloody. It'll really make his day if you email asking about this. Tell you what, you, exploration companies are using this. That's a frigging big tick from me. So anyway, you want your chair back, Trav? <laughs> no, nah, you can keep it for the rest of oh, it. You suppose, can look skinny for the rest of it. I suppose I can. Thank, thanks, mate. I'm gonna, I can't wait to zoom in on you on that wide shot over there. Yeah, I'll... Uh, what do we want to uh, quickly, quickly rip through the last couple of boys? Bloody, what do we got going on in the tungsten world? EQ Resources. Yeah, EQ Resources. So tungsten, mate, they're ramping up production at their Mount Carbine tungsten mine in North Queensland. If you remember back a few months ago, uh, I think we talked about their deal to get hold of the uh, barrack. Porto project in the uh, Salamanca province in Spain involving private equity group Oak Tree. Um, yeah, for all, the, for all the Howard Marks fans out there. So today's announcement relates to uh, the Mount Carbine project through um, which oh, just just that project, not not the not the Spanish one. They hit record production coming out of the March quarter, so 507 wet metric tons of, of concentrate in Mar- in the in the March quarter. That um, the production number is strong, right? But uh, you know, and they even had a cyclone in the in the quarter there. But the real number that we care about is always cash flow. The last few quarters for EQR they've been disappointing on that front. So hopefully, when the actual quarterly comes out showing cash flow, hopefully it shows that they're making money now. Yes, yeah, right. Last, last one, JD, take her away, mate. <clears throat> the most uh, elongated bloody permitting for uranium going on for a while. Berkeley yeah. Energy R. Even as uh, even as uranium goes, this one's a bit of a drag. So Berkeley Energy, they've got a the project in the in the middle of Spain. So they're taking their dispute with Spain to international arbitration now, and the market actually liked it. It ticked up fifteen percent. They got an EV of about seventy bucks. They've got seventy five in cash. So wow. the lawyers won't be too stressed. They're well funded to to pay them all. It's been a long, long journey. What they're after is final approvals for the Salamanca uranium mine slash project in the in the sort of western part of Spain there. So it's a pretty chunky uranium deposit, 83 million tonnes at 514 parts per million for a total of 89 million pounds. But that that doesn't really matter here because permitting has been the risk and it's hung around for, for years. I've sort of had this one on the watch list going back probably at least five years now. They had a DFS come out in 2016 that put operating costs at US 15 bucks a pound. Obviously, there'd be massive cost inflation since then, but it just gives you a, a little bit of a feel. They've been jumping through a whole bunch of hoops with all these different legal bodies, trying to build certain things. Plan A doesn't work. Plan B being held up by the the energy minister and the the nuclear safety council in Spain. So there's just been a real, real drag. And I mean, one of the, the real reasons, if you're trying to get to why this project is under such an enormous amount of scrutiny, is that the region, you know, the, the sort of very local region that they're in, just aren't big fans of mining in general. And there's, it's, it's a bit of a common theme. There's other projects in Spain that have had similar regulatory problems, not just uranium, we're talking lithium projects. Mm. And all sorts. So, but then you got Matza, all good for Zanfar, well, that, different part of Spain. That southern part of Spain has a very rich mining history, so it's it's a little different there. You know, like you say, Matza. There's a whole bunch of even into Portugal in that Iberian pyrite um, region there. But yeah, it's it's sort of region by region across Europe, really, and this is a particular spot where it's not popular. It's been going on a long time. These disputes at the International Centre of Settlements of Investment Disputes, a bit of a mouthful, they've got an average duration of 3.6 years. But, I mean, the way I see it, it's 
it's not a very winnable situation. I'd have to, you know, get get my feet on the ground there to get a better feel for what the locals actually think and if that is the real hold up for the project. But if that is the the hold up and it's that the community doesn't want the mine, then it's going to be incredibly difficult to get it going, even if you do have the the permits to do so. So remains to be seen. Oh, beautiful boys! I reckon we broke the record on a three on a just an us chat. But hey, it's got to be a PB. You break, you break records when the content's fucking awesome, and you boys have done a sensational job. Good on you, lads, mate. Thanks to bloody the partners during the show, WA Water Boys, and Verify. I reckon yeah. it's any time. <laughs> oh, you reckon it's? Anytime. Oh yeah, shit. <laughs> fuck. Oh, I just confused the fuck out of myself. <laughs> <laughs> right, no, thanks to all the bloody partners on the show. Anytime exploration and verify. Give Seamus Murphy a call and give Grant at verify.com an email to get a hold of that AI bloody legendary stuff. Get wet solutions also. DSI Underground, Silverstone, Brooks Airways. And remember and that's Brooks, Brooks Equipment Eye, Brooks Sales, bloody everything. And K Drill. Thanks, money miners. Oodaroo. Oodaroo. Oh, mate, great episode coming tomorrow. Oh, stay tuned. Fucking ripper. Stay ripper. tuned. Oodaroo. <laughs> The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.